All right, here we are with another episode of the High Ground, powered by Premier Companies. Good morning, Sal. Good morning. How we doing? I'm great. Hey, we got a couple guests in. Uh, uh, Travis Corman and Ben McCoy with um, uh, AgX. XAG Apply. And uh, XAG, XAG Apply. Apply. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 You're okay. And uh, yeah, we're excited to talk about your drone applications and where you're from and how this all got started. So, uh, but uh, we're going to start the day off with the question of the day. We took it easy on you guys. This is all personal experience type question here. So... So tell us what was the favorite concert of yours you've ever attended? Oh man, thank you for being here. Uh, I, uh, I'm a pretty boring guy. First of all, I don't like crowds, so I've been. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be a problem. <laughs> that knocks down that right. Um, so no, I'd, I'd have been to a George Strait concert, so that was pretty neat. But yeah. uh, I'm at- more of the as up to man as years ago, decades ago, probably before I was in the service and everything. Um, it, it was up in Indianapolis up there when oh. he came through a long time ago. But otherwise, I, I just like the, you know, 20, 30 guys in a bar. I don't care if the guy's known or not. I just, the yep. low-key, sure. small little, you know, six string on a knee is yep. my type of thing. <laughs> nice. So, I like it. Yeah. So. I like it. Uh, George Strait. I saw him on his farewell tour twice. I think it was a couple years ago, Louisville and Lexington. So wow. you, went, you wouldn't let him quit. I wouldn't. No. I you wouldn't. Went. I want to see him again, too, because I think he's back out. You so. went to Alabama, too, didn't you? Yes, I did. So that's saying something, because yes. I wanted to go to that one, but I, I had the opportunity, but I didn't like people. So. Nice. <laughs> so. <laughs> Crow, crowds of people just, uh, you know, people you're not just... Real comfor- get you're not real comfortable in here. No, there's too many people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know there was going to be a crowd. <laughs> Maybe if you need somebody to leave, I guess I can. Yeah. <laughs> can I call in? <laughs> no, that's what... So, yeah. Well, mine's a little different. Usually it's... Uh, it always is. Yeah, little, yours is always a little different. My wife and I ended up in Vail, Colorado, and Kid Rock was out there and this was in the um, uh, late winter kind of um, maybe very early spring and he was out there for an outdoor concert and my wife and I are not skiers but we kind of ended up on this ski trip and anyway uh, I had my deer hunting camouflage on she was she was dressed up like a skier but I had on my deer hunting camo uh, Gore-Tex and fleece hat and you look like ted nugent being there yeah <laughs> and so uh you can imagine in vale colorado the crowd that we were with and people were like cool hat man <laughs> <laughs> sure. that was, yeah and that was a kid rock and we had a heck of a good time was this in kid rock's heyday yes oh, it was so back in the day there you so go. it was uh it was something <laughs> nice i tried to get kim to get on my shoulders and get up we get up close to the stage but she's like no no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to know that she's always been the one with the that has the always. Sense. Yeah, good, good. That's good to know. So, so mine. I'll make it quick. But we got uh, we scored Garth Brooks tickets in the late nineties, and uh, we scored these tickets. We bought six of them, I believe, and every one of them was individual seats. Well, so <laughs> my <laughs> seat. <laughs> yeah, well, that's all you could get. I mean, it sold out like five times in a row or whatever. So the seat I have, my my back is touching the back wall of the auditorium. So my my wife, she comes up, and she's actually, like, just sitting on one knee. So we could actually be together because we're, like, eight rows apart in totally different sections. Well, here comes a guy with a flashlight and a badge up to the top. And I'm like, well, here we go. See ya. We're out of here. <laughs> I'm in my seat. Yeah, exactly. I don't, yeah, yeah. See I'll, Carla, you. I'll get pictures. You know? yeah. <laughs> Not good ones because I, can, I can barely see him myself. So um, so anyway, he walks up there and he said, uh, are these your seats? I'm like, yep. He said, well, we uh, Garth always picks out the worst seats in the house and reserves the first two rows for those people. And we're offering you complimentary tickets to second row. So, unfortunately, the other four people who are scattered <laughs> all throughout the building see us. <laughs> you begin, know yeah, way. begin to make our way to the front of the stage. So, yeah, so when we were a second row, so the first row, when, when he comes out, they get up and move to the stage. So, we're actually basically front row. And uh, for for a Garth Brooks concert, it is heyday. <laughs> my, so, my wife has awesome. tried to get Garth Brooks concerts tickets. I think we bought them twice over now, and that's like through the COVID thing. And yep. like he canceled and canceled. This kept rescheduling. And hmm. oh man, that's a nightmare. That's yep. impressive that you. It yeah. was fun. It was uh, it was interesting. I, yeah. I don't know. It was it was good, but I know the rest <laughs> of our group not that impressed. <laughs> 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 
But we tried to share with them how awesome it was. <laughs> I, I told them all about it. Right? It was really cool. I wish you guys could have been there. So, so anyway, so that's what I've got. So go ahead, Sal. <laughs> well, before we get started, I got to tell you, as soon as Travis got in here and sat down, him and Ben sat down here. And so he's got the uh, obsessive compulsive about crowds and also wires, apparently. Because yeah. the first thing he did <laughs> was he goes... I need zip ties. I need. I gotta, <laughs> so, <laughs> what is this unorganized? So, <laughs> that's like, that stems that stems from us, you know, putting technology into ag equipment and stuff like that. And oh my gosh, it's around your feet. I'm looking down. And I'm like, yeah, I'm right. rolling over it with my chair right now. I can yeah. fix this, guys. I can, I can, I can, I can help you out. I promise. <laughs> and it won't hiring? take long. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys are hiring, you gotta, you gotta fell over here. So. <laughs> No. Well, let's uh, so let's bigger get on topic. Topic. So, uh, experience ag. Mm-hmm. Um, so this, you're going to be our drone provider this year for spring. Yeah. So experience ag, we primarily do service and sales of technology. So we sell drones, but then we also do technology within automation of ag. Um, X Ag Apply is a sister company that uh, is co-owned um, with that. So. We do the drone application. It's an application only company that's you know fully licensed for the aerial application of primarily fungicides, herbicides, you know wherever we fit into that space. We probably need to back up a little bit and and say how you got to that point. So let's let's do some personal introductions first, and then yeah. we'll get into. So Travis, you tell us your story. Duh. I don't know how far back you want to go. Um, you didn't meet your wife in a crowd, but no, I didn't meet my wife in a crowd. <laughs> no, I actually met my wife in Hawaii, so that was you know far enough away. But that's another story, another time. Um, we, I kind of got into the technology space, started Experience Ag in 2014. Um, you know, was at working at a local company here in Seymour. Prior to that, and just kind of got overwhelmed um, with uh, how they ran the thing and the lack of service on it. Really like the service side. Um, so kind of went out and started working for a grower, had a lot of people calling saying you need to do your own thing, started as a single man show in 2014. Um, and we've just kind of grown it from there. I realized that those people rely on me and I need more than just me for them to rely on. Um, you know, if I'm sick, I can't make it whatever worst case is. Um, so we started to grow, um, and that's kind of brought us to where we are today with that side of the business. Um, the XAG apply a quick thing on that, I guess, uh, we looked for another way to enter the service space um, that was unique um, and not just pulling soil samples, doing something else that, uh, you know, with experience ag, we wanted to just, you know, kind of create another partnership there. Um, so we kind of got into that last year. We, uh, we flew, I think we flew 5,700 acres. We had a uh, one drone primarily out doing that. So we, we had a proof of concept. We were really pushing pretty hard on that and realized that this may be something there is a demand for this. Um, so we just, uh, you know, approached you guys and um we're going to be flying some acres for you i understand this year and uh we're excited about that so we've yeah. kind of teamed up and personneled up to make that happen good so and ben i graduated purdue and went back to home went back home and started working on the farm with my dad and then kind of 10 years went by and just felt like i wanted something more and jumped into the ag financial space actually working for a, a credit union up north as an underwriter and travis approached me a couple years into that and wanted to dive into the data side of farming and the technology use. And that kind of intrigued me and I jumped head in and that's kind of where I've been with the company. But as X ag apply kind of got spun off, I got to really working on that side and really enjoyed that as well. And kind of riding along the ride and enjoying, enjoying kind of where we've gone and where we're going to hopefully go. Well, we have a busy summer coming up. So tell us about these drones that we are, that you're, that we're going to spray fungicides primarily uh, to keep the plants healthy for those listeners that may not be familiar with everything we do. So kind of describe when we picture a drone, they're like this big. Right? Yeah, we should have brought one. We could have put one on the table here for you guys. Yeah, that would have been good. <laughs> so um, so tell know, us about these drones. The drones, uh, they're a lot bigger than what you typically think. We do several outings with schools, and, you know, kids just are amazed. Um, Give them rides. Yeah, they all want to ride. <laughs> that's the number one question. That's the number Every one question. Kid ever. Can we ride it? No, we can't ride it. That's like a lawnmower blade splint above your head. Um, so they don't, you know, of course, that never enters your head as a kid is the safety side of it. Um, but no, the, the, the drones are made. Um, there's some manufacturers that are primarily focused on making ag spray drones. Um, Helio is one brand that is like that. DJI, that's your little drones from pocket size mm-hmm. to they make huge ones as well. 
Um, so we have both, you know, a couple sets of each. Um, but you're looking at a drone that's going to be about um, eight and a half, nine feet tip to tip on a uh, wow. um, from rotor to rotor and stuff. Um, they can lift about 200 pound capacity, um, you know, with themselves included in that weight. So um, the ones we got right now, I think the largest drones are approved for uh, application or 10 gallon capacity on your on your tank size. It's quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and batteries are still a limiting factor. Um, on what we're doing today is, uh, you know, how long your flight times can be based on your batteries. And that's what also limits payload capability. Um, payload capability is also limited on what the FAA um, um, approves for flight. You know, they don't really, I think they're kind of worried about uh, homeland security and stuff like that going on. So you have to know all the laws and regulations of what's up in the air mm-hmm. because you're big enough to do a lot of damage now. We're not just flying a little bitty pocket drone to take pictures not a camera drone no it is not no no and and really they're like the drones we have even if you want to retrofit a camera on them they're not useful for that because they don't have the flight times um or maneuverability or anything like that for Mm -hmm. that type they're made for carrying and spraying Mm -hmm. specific purpose yeah yeah you don't run a floater truck out to just go deliver seed right it's got a purpose you know it could fit in the back you could do it but you don't drive a floater right to go deliver your seed so the same thing so you booms on them so, no, they don't. Um, they don't actually. The first generations, they did have a spray boom that was under them. A lot of those spray booms were about 20 foot wide or something like that. But what these have is they use the rotor wash. So where you guys, where typically we think drift is bad, you know, that's one of those things in spray that we're saying, hey, you know, watch your drift. We have to create drift mm-hmm. because the rotor wash and prop wash blows that down into the canopy hmm. um, and gets you good penetration down in there. So, um, but these, uh, you know, they're not any wider than what they are. I think we have 16 nozzles. Yes. I think 16 nozzles per drone. Yep. Um, and then, you know, of course you size up and you, you do a lot of studies on your, uh, on your, I guess your wet cards, your water yep. sensitive papers. Spray paper, yeah. Yep. Yeah. To see, uh, what you've got in your coverages across the board and how wide you can actually spray. A lot of them, you know, they'll advertise 32 feet, 35 feet spray width and stuff. And depending on your crop is how wide you actually can go. Mm-hmm. Okay. So how yeah. far above cop canopy do you fly? Uh, we like to set a rule of about 10 feet um, and stuff like that. If you get much lower than that, the obstacle avoidance on the drones, um, if you fly a waterway across a waterway that's mowed and you got 10 foot wall of corn, it'll try to drop down in the canopy oh, and wow. it senses mm-hmm. that, you know, that corn on the fall side and it'll, it'll stop itself. Um, so there becomes a lot of intensive of management or maybe it won't get picked up fast enough to get over that. Um, so you're truly 10 feet's really good, but if you walk out there and you have a hat on your head, 10 feet's close to blowing the hat off your head. I mean, if it's hovering over top of you and stuff. Mm. So it gets a lot of good, and we see a lot of good wind penetration down into the crop um, and movement of that. Uh, and we're trying to get to the ear leaf, which is four right. foot from the top of the yeah. crop. Mm-hmm. And, and, and slightly below, to my understanding. Most disease mm-hmm. pressures come yep. up from the ground up. So yep. if you can start a resistance in a, in, you know, below that ear leaf, um, that's where we set a lot of our, uh, you know, our water sensitive papers at two foot, and we measure them in two foot intervals going up to, to see what we're getting there. So, okay. so mm-hmm. it follows the terrain. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's yep. terrain, yeah. There's terrain compensation, uh, terrain modeling, I guess. So it it tries to. Uh, the only time you really got to watch that it doesn't follow terrain is when it says come back home. It says I'm a hundred foot above this point or fifty or whatever you set it at. It won't follow that anymore. It says, I set to that elevation, now I'm flying forward. So if you're coming back up out of some bottom ground and you're flying up over a, you know, pretty steep hill and you got some trees, you really got to pay attention to mm-hmm. watch because it's just going to keep on trucking. Mm-hmm. So, that, I mean, then, so, yeah. I was assuming, yeah. You don't want to buy so, too many of them. No. Yeah. So but getting them back out of trees isn't fun. So, oh God. so. like Charlie Brown. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. So, so who's your pilots? Are you well, guys the pilots? Actually, there's a couple of pilots on the end down here. I don't know. These guys. <laughs> <laughs> so they were saying they had their 107s. Um, yes, everybody within our company, um, I'm going to say everybody, but everybody has taken the, you know, taken the step to go and get your 107. Um, and that's a requirement that we have to have within. So anybody we've hired for this has all got 107s. And your dual redundancy, we normally have two pilot, licensed pilots on the ground. Yep. Um, that way, if we have a guy call in sick, we're still able to run that crew and let him fly um, and stuff like that. Um, Plus that covers us from a multi drone out of one scenario. Um, There's exemptions and there's laws saying you put the word swarm, multi drones, you know, politically correct, but swarm is what some of the media likes to use and say, this is what, you know, national security doesn't want. A swarm is anything more than one drone, you know, operated by a single operator. 
Okay. So, you know, when we have two licensed pilots on the ground, we're allowed to fly two drones mm -hmm. with no exemptions in place mm -hmm. um, and stuff like that because the liability falls down to one per aircraft. So um, that's a, that's another way to, for redundancy and safety to say, no, hey, we're – we're not only within the law, we're kind of covering ourselves. Now we have, you know, you, you apply for all your exemptions, you have your exemptions for a, you know, multi-drone scenario, but that, you know, it's better to have redundancy in there and stuff. So, hmm. sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. So how are you service, uh, how are you uh, tendering these? So when you go to the field, what goes? Not a guy in a, you don't pull this thing out of um, the trunk and let it go. Sure. No, so. no. We actually saw a picture the other day of somebody that was, you know, they're spraying out of the back of their truck and their generator caught their uh, pickup truck on fire because it got hot. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was one of those deals where it got hot, must have been blowing exhaust on the side of the truck, and then, of course, something went up. Probably their fuel cans were in the back of the truck, but it, yeah, they Lovely. had the whole thing melted. Because it <laughs> takes big generators. It yeah. takes a lot of power to charge these batteries fast, yeah. And and charging them fast is what, you know, what the key is. So you're typically charging a battery every nine minutes. Um, our flight time's every eight, so you can quickly get behind wow. there. So you okay. got to make sure you have enough chargers wow. to stay ahead of what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, we uh, on our setup, we have uh, we have 26-foot enclosed gooseneck trailers. We carry a 1,000 gallon of water to the field with us, which will allow us to apply... Um, you know, over a day's worth of um, water, you're going to have some wash, some washouts, some different things like that. So you're going to use some water through the course of the day. Um, but that keeps us going all day without having to try to tender out to them and bring them more, you know, hmm. more water. Um, but you're going to have a thousand gallon of water going. You got uh, the generator capacity to be able to charge that, which I think we pull, I think our, we're pulling about 140 amps of power um, oh, wow. out of mm -hmm. one, out of one trailer. Um, so you got to be able to cut that into two. I think the max capacity we can pull is 144 off the generator capacity. And then you're jumping up into, you know, diesel powered, liquid cooled, big semi trailer style generators. Um, and at that, you're going to have to put that on a, another platform, get your CDLs. I mean, you start, you, your workforce all of a sudden starts to drop. You guys mm -hmm. understand that. Mm -hmm. Um, so we roll out with that. Um, you got your charging stations, you got your mixing, um, your inductors, you, where you kind of do all your chemicals in the back, and then uh, your flight deck up on top to where your pilot's at, and they can keep an eye on everything. So, so, yeah. So how many people would be standing at the end of the field then if you've got one drone running? You talking about people watching? <laughs> no. <laughs> not, not, the, not the passerby, <laughs> no, huh? Right, no, um, employed. Employed. Uh, we've got two people out I'm there. Assuming, yeah. I'm assuming passerbys are several. That's a lot. It's oh, amazing. It's, and and it, we actually encourage it. Um, it's fun because they think it's neat. They really, I mean, drones have kind of been an eye-catching thing. People like to fly them around in the living room or whatever it is. But you see these things, big things, flying out at night. They don't know what they are flying around. And um, and it's also another another thing to be able to educate. And, and as you kind of said, fungicide, you kind of re referenced it earlier, we're actually helping the crop. Mm -hmm. um, it's not we're sitting here trying to kill your neighbor's cows. or, I mean, now you do get guys that kind of, you know, flip off the lid before they understand what you're doing and what you're trying to do. But um, you show them, they get excited at that point um, and stuff. So we we encourage it. I mean, now you have to watch the safety and say, okay, hey, stay back. They're going to come in and, you know, and do this stuff. But no, I mean, from school events to, you know, fairs to whatever it is, I mean, it's it's something that we've really made a push to get out there and mm -hmm. kind of any time you can, can, can educate in, edu in agriculture – you're better off. I mean, yeah. there's just a, a lack of understanding across the board. And that's so. what this is. That's what yeah. that's kind of how, uh, Ryan, we started this to educate and let people know. Yeah. How does the drone, how does it, you're not actually flying it. You don't actually manually fly it. Now you have the option to, there's a manual flight control, um, you know, available and stuff like that. But actually you pre-program it. Um, you set a geofence um, around it saying don't leave, you know, so... If that's your field, say, hey, stay with inside that perimeter and stay out of this area. And it, it says, here's your flight path going back and forth at a certain angle or whatever it is and certain width. And you say go, and it says, okay, I'm empty. I come back, and you fill it back up, change your battery, and it uploads itself again and goes back out. So it's pretty much fully fully automated, um, which is exciting for us as a company. That's one thing we wanted to be you know, in the front end of when this all started out is you know, it's autonomy. Um, and I think, you know, with, with sprayers, whatever it may be in the future, moving forward, that's, that's going to be a space we excel in from a service-based industry. Um, so it, so this is a, a natural step in that direction. Cause I think we're going to take that same, that same platform in a sense, and you're going to be able to apply it to, 
you know, what's happening on the ground in the field versus in the air. Wow. So, so what do you, what do you think the next thing's going to be? I mean, this is, I know this is still the thing <clears throat> and it's not even really happened yet. I mean, we've done some trials and, and now you're right in the middle of, of this brand new technology and, um, we've got other industries that are kind of helping pull ag along big companies like Amazon and, and, um, that's helping a bunch too, because that's actually, you know, with their, with their weight. And then like, so a lot of the biggest thing right now, you don't, why you don't have a, um, package delivery by drones happening is there has to be a line of sight, right? Someone has mm. to maintain a visual line of sight of that drone at all times. Well, there is a what they call a, a B B L O S I think B B L O S yeah yeah vi- beyond visual line of sight exemption that you can get. Um, now you get that beyond visual line of sight. Sometimes we're after dark and there's a nighttime exemption you got to get. So you start hmm. double stacking. You know you start stacking these things up and then you want to fly two drones. There's a swarm exemption. You know now they think oh my gosh this guy wants to go fly drones after dark because he's want to do something bad with them and he's doing a bunch of them. <laughs> Right, a swarm. Too. Yeah, swarm. Yeah, so with chemicals on it. Yeah, with chemicals on it, right? I mean, this guy's this guy's going after something big, um, and it's not the case. Um, but with the help of like your Walmart, your Amazons, and stuff like that, um, that have you know the pocketbook and the the patients probably at the government level um, to be able to explain, no, this is this is legitimate, and, mm-hmm. and there's a way to do this safe safely um that's only going to help this industry too you know we piggyback a lot of times you know the automotive industry with technologies Mm -hmm. and cameras and you know stuff like that um but as far as your question on where do you think this is going um i it i think you're going to see a lot of uh autonomy start to enter the space and i think that but autonomy is probably not going to be at the individual grower level um i think what you'll probably see is providers have something that says hey follow me out here um, so maybe, you know, maybe it's premier ag. Like saying, a tag hey, along. A tag along. Yeah. Maybe I've got a four row planter, but there's a second one that just mimics me through the field. Right. Cause the loss of one row unit on a four row. And if you have six of these in the field, you're still productive on 80% mm-hmm. of your fleet right now. 24 row planter goes down because one little bit thing doesn't work on a planter. They're done. Right. And they can't get, now you have one person that's highly qualified to run that. But if he can monitor what the other five are doing out there, I think you're going to see some of that, and that's going to help with a uh, um, a lack of labor. I don't want to, I don't want to say a shortage, a lack yeah. of qualified labor. Yeah, um, that's out there. So, yeah. well, I mean, there's other issues too. As the machinery gets bigger, we get into soil compaction, and and that school of thought started probably 15 years it ago has. about it has. Um, do we go backwards and do we go back instead of you know 24 yeah. rows? Do we go back to like compaction with six huge. rows? Yeah, compaction's a big issue. Um, with what they've got. And if you look at the, you know, just to take the standard layout of a, uh, of a row unit, we have to create compaction to create a seed trench, right? That's the design of a row unit. It opens it up. You have to have compaction for a sidewall, right? Well, we limit our planting windows because of moisture, because we create compaction. So yeah. until there's developmental changes within how we get that seed in the ground, they've only been able to offset that with going bigger to get more in the ground at the same time. You know, you can't expand your window, you can put it in, but you can expand what you can do in that window. So until there's a change to that, you're not going to change, you know, some of that other thought process. So, hmm. but, so I don't know. I mean, that, that's where I kind of see it going, I guess. And I don't know, Ben may have some. No, I agree. I mean, that's what we've looked into now for what two years is that, that space to get ready for it. So, so limitations uh, to drones is it is the weight uh, is that our is that our limiting factor? This two hundred pounds is that a magic? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I don't think weight's the limiting factor. No, here. there's there's. I mean, like we were down in Texas looking at another one that I mean, it's nineteen feet tip to tip. Okay, right. I so mean, so this isn't you, the biggest. Now no. you look at you look at what's 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 legal and what they allow us to use comparative to what the manufacturers can provide. You know, if you start getting to Lockheed, and I mean, this is all, I mean, they're flying stuff in overseas from the middle of the desert out west right i mean so your your range and the communication it's all there it's all possible it's what we're going to be allowed to do in the civilian sector that really is going to is the limiting factor and what you know what they say is sensible from us you know from a fact so so but i think the limiting factor within using on us i think you know we're big data components and and taking that back to a usable level yeah they they Uh, don't they don't pump out that much data right now 
Th- no. They have the ability to. I mean, they're mapping it, they're tracking it, but to get it in a raw form, it's just not. It's not easy in some sense. Understanding the value of that too is them understanding the value of that and how it can be used back down into our level and mm-hmm. the decisions we can make from that. That's, you know, it's one thing for us to say we're going to do it, but them to understand what we need out of it um, is another, I think. Yeah, totally. I mean, we could make what prescription maps with these things if we had the data mm-hmm. and could pump it in really easily. I mean, some of them do it on a rough scale, but not efficiently. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So. But I probably think, technology will change faster than the ability to keep up with the investment. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's simpler trying to keep up on a, any digital mm-hmm. device you have. You know, you you purchase it, and you basically you need to make sure that that thing you have it. You have a plan for that laid out in front of you, saying, "Hey, I need to run this, and I need to make sure this thing stays around for this long." Um, and that's what you try to do with all technology that you get. You know, you don't buy this cell phone today and say, "Well, next month I'm going to buy another one." You say, "Well, I'll probably run that until I break it." Mm-hmm. So, you hope. Yeah, you hope, right? <laughs> Let's not use that analogy with the drone. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, you try. No. No. Exactly. So, so, to clarify, how many are you running now? Uh, we've got six. six we got nine. six drones, so you okay. got three full-time crews that are going to be running, and we'll be running those guys uh, as much to around the clock as you can. So we got 12 personnel to run those three crews. Okay. Great. So, so it'll be a... Yeah. Other capabilities of the drone? Dry? Seeding? Yep. Seeding, do that. fertilizer, cover crop, all yeah. that kind of cover stuff. Yeah, cover crop yep. is a big thing. Um, you know, you're looking at a lot smaller scale than what your spreaders are. So, you know, you're looking at smaller feed gate openings, smaller things like that. So, clean cover crop, we've learned. Um, lower poundages, you're not going to go hit 50 pounds of the acre mm-hmm. and do it efficiently. Uh, and, I mean, we could do it, but it's going to be cost prohibitive for someone to do that. But, sure. You know, your radishes mm-hmm. and different things like that. But, mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, so that's a... Uh, on these types of things, I'd say that's probably about what you got. You got a spreader bin and any capability of a spreader bin. And then, you know, you got your application, whether that be, um, you know, your liquid or your folder feeding. But granulars are rough on small pumps. You know, we got small pumps. Our tip sizes are, you know, anywhere from one to two. Threes wow. are big. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, wow. try to shove that through a three, you're going to have to have something that can pretty well mixed up and flow easy. Yeah. So. Mm. So, you know, as an applicator, you kind of understand some of the limiting factors on that at some point. But, you know, so can't flow many big, big things through there. Okay. All right. Well, interesting. Ben, so, Travis, do you have anything else that we didn't cover? I'm sure there are. Oh, man. I can't. I mean, no, I can't think of anything. You didn't say much today, Ben. Well, this is how this typically always goes. <laughs> I, knew, I knew this was going to happen before we got here. It was fine. I, I, well, it, you got to ride down anyway. Right, Maybe you'll right. buy lunch on the way yeah. back. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so, no. Absolutely. Well, Travis well, is going to Travis is gonna stay here. He's going to he's gonna fix yeah. all these cables. You guys will see me crawling right. under a table here in yep. time in just a minute. Just Get this <laughs> mess cleaned up. <laughs> hey, that was a panic attack. Wow. Well. So. All right. Well, uh, again, you know, guys, thank you so much. X Ag Apply, a division of uh, Experience Ag out of Greensburg. So yeah, we're yeah. we're thankful you're here and and uh, look forward to yeah the thank, season. Yeah, I think thankfully. we're gonna have a good season. Hopefully, you guys, so. let's come back at a time. We appreciate it. It's fun. We that was a lot easier than I thought. I'm not near as nervous. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we'll get some video and some pictures from you and overlay some of that through yeah. this uh, through yeah. this publication. So thank, thank you, you so much. I think that's all I've got. That's all I've got. Thank Thank you, you guys. Appreciate it. Here's another episode of the High Ground, powered by Premier Companies. Please like and subscribe. Thanks. Thank you all.